Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. The latest book in the Deikan series, Volume 3, is now out. If you'd like to learn more about some of Japan's most haunted and dangerous spots, then this is the book for you. You can find all sorts of abandoned shrines, hospitals, parks, and even lesser-known places that you wouldn't even think could be haunted. That's Neikan, The Most Haunted Locations in Japan, Volume 3, out now. This week, we're looking at various creatures, monsters, and kamisama that you'll likely want to be careful messing with. Sometimes they're helpful, but more often than not, they don't want to be your friend. First up, when a village goes against its lord in an attempt to alleviate their water pains, someone must pay the price. But who? Find out in Nolken Summer. I'm going to write about a custom back at our family home that I had assumed up until now was an Obon event. Well, it's more accurately a custom in my grandmother's family on my mother's side. They live deep in the mountains in an area that often suffered from a lack of water in the past. As such, a wealthy farmer from the area used his own money to build dams and irrigation and such, which made it possible to grow rice there. However, the lord, or the daimyo, or whatever, didn't give them permission to build these canals. So, the wealthy farmer's mother offered her own life in exchange. I heard this story from my grandmother. Let's get into it. Around Obon time, Several houses in the area, including my grandmother's, would have a bonfire that lasted all night by the banks of the river. At least two people would stay by the fire to watch over it. Being that this took place during Obon, I thought it was just a welcoming fire for the returning spirits, or maybe a fire to see them off, but that wasn't it at all. When I was in high school, I had to watch over the fire one time, and I learned that it was actually to inform Nolkensama that the irrigation canal is being properly surveyed. According to my grandmother and other relatives, this Nolkensama was actually the mother of the wealthy farmer who begged the Lord to build a canal. When the irrigation canal was first built, the villagers noticed a suspicious light on the bank during the night, so when they went to check it out, they apparently found the ghost of the wealthy farmer's mother holding a lantern. And so, that's apparently why they decided to light a fire on her behalf. If they did that for a few days during the summer, then Nolken Summer's ghost wouldn't appear. But sometimes, the suspicious light appeared at unexpected times. And if you lit the fire alone, then she might take you with her. In fact, When my grandmother was a child, during the Taisho era, there was a servant who guarded the fire alone, but he fell into the river and then died. Well, there are gibbons out there, my grandmother said, and it was probably one of them that dragged him into the river. But when I was in high school and tasked with watching the fire, the old guy with me, a relative, left to go do his business. Next thing I knew, I could see the half-transparent work clothes of someone from a period drama or something, just a few metres ahead of me. Like, just their lower half. When the old guy came back, I told him something was there, and he was like, Oh, sorry. So they appeared, huh? He said he had a cigarette while he went to the toilet. Like, come on. I never experienced anything strange after that though, and that custom of watching the fire still takes place even now. Next, a ghost seems to be haunting a young boy's school, but what's the terrifying truth behind what's really going on? Find out in Tsunbai-san. This happened when I was in the fifth grade. At the time, taking ghost photos was really popular at my school. 
Several people in my class walked around the building after school with disposable cameras, taking photos of spots where they thought they might capture a ghost. Of course, you can't just take a ghost photo by pointing it randomly at places, and the teachers often got angry at us for hanging around too long after school. But I think most of us just wanted to enjoy the thrill of maybe seeing something scary with our friends. As time went on, naturally we got bored and stopped playing. But my brother, who was two years younger than me, so a third grader at the same school, was still really into it. One day, we were walking around the school like always, when we heard a bang coming from the gym, like something had hit the floor. We went over to see if someone was maybe playing basketball, but nobody was there. However, in front of the stage, there was a single green unicycle. Both my brother and I thought that maybe someone had forgotten to put it away. There were lots of students who just left the unicycles where they were when it was home time, so the sight wasn't especially strange. But the wheel was still spinning, like someone had just dropped it there. Finding it strange, I thought that maybe it was T's doing. He often took ghost photos with us after school, so I turned to the area behind the stage and called out his name, but there was no response. My brother checked to see if anyone was hiding behind the stage, but there wasn't anyone there, nor even in the storage area. The gym was empty, other than us. It was after school, so all the doors were locked other than the one connecting the gym to the school hall. Suddenly, I felt very creeped out, and I returned to the school building with my brother. He got scared when I started running, and we both ran to the fifth grade classroom to pick up our bags. But I had to go to the toilet first, so we went into the ones in front of the classroom once we got there. My brother didn't need to go, but he was scared of being alone, so he walked in behind me. Then, suddenly, we heard a bang inside one of the stalls. We were both so surprised that we jumped and then my brother ran right out the door. Looking back on it now, I was so scared that I ran out of the toilets pulling my pants up before I'd even finished doing my business. I grabbed my bag and ran home like the wind. Children are strange creatures, however, and even after such a frightening experience, I went back to school the next day like nothing had happened. And that morning, my brother and I were determined to find out what caused those strange happenings from the day before. But once I reached my classroom, I realised that something was wrong. The air in the room was strange. Usually everyone would be chatting and running around, but most kids were already sitting at their desks. The reason for that was something written on the blackboard. Yesterday, someone didn't put their unicycle away. Those who played in the gym and didn't put the equipment away must see Mr. Nanny Nanny at lunch. Our homeroom teacher was very particular about things being neat and tidy, so everyone started the day feeling grim. I remembered seeing a unicycle in the gym after school the day before, so I thought that was what the message was talking about. It had nothing to do with me, so I wasn't worried. But the real question was, why would the teacher leave a message on the blackboard like that for a single unicycle left out in the gym? Lots of students always left them out. Not just the fifth graders either. Students from the first to the sixth grade often forgot to put them away. But still, everyone was on edge. Before long, first period started and the teacher entered the room. He greeted us like always, and then right before class was due to start, he started talking about the message on the blackboard. There are toilets right in front of our classroom, yes? Yesterday, someone left one of the green first grader unicycles in one of the stalls after school. When I heard that, I was so confused that I tilted my head. No. More than confused, I suddenly got goosebumps. Yesterday. 
My brother and I heard a loud noise in one of those toilet stalls in front of the classroom. Was the sound we heard a unicycle falling over inside the stall? I suddenly got scared for no reason. Our school had three types of unicycles, and they were split into colours depending on whether they were for the lower, middle or upper grades. Green was for the first and second grade, yellow for third and fourth, and red for fifth and sixth. Because it was a green one, they thought maybe it was a kid trying to frame the younger grades. A mean prank, where they threw it into the toilets from their own grade. Of course, suspicion naturally fell on us, but nobody had any idea who might have done it. Only my brother and I had a vague suspicion that someone had been in the fifth grade boys' toilets after school the day before. At any rate, it became a bit of an issue, and after that, the entire school was instructed to look after and take good care of all the playground equipment. Nobody left equipment lying around after that, but in the end, they never figured out who did it either. And in the end, we weren't able to clear up the suspicion that someone in the fifth grade did it, leaving my classmates and I unsatisfied with the result. As such, I decided for myself that it must have been a ghost, and so we again started our ghost photo games after school. Of course, the most suspicious spot of all was the fifth grade boys' toilets. My brother was too scared to join me after what happened, so I walked around the school building by myself as the sun set. Looking back on it now, that's quite chilling. I took photos with a disposable camera all over the toilets and screamed, Come on, ghost photo, appear! It didn't make much sense, but then I took a photo of myself in the mirror too. Then I took a picture of the yellowed toilet bowl, the floor, inside the dark cleaning closet, and of course, the haunted toilet stall in question. A few days later, my parents had the developed photos I asked them for when I got home from school, so I dropped my bag by the front door and ran to my bedroom. My heart pounding with excitement, I looked through the 40-something pictures I'd taken. If I saw anything suspicious, then I could convince myself that it was the work of a ghost. But reality is a wretched thing, and there wasn't any signs of anything ghostly in the photos. They were all unfocused, crazy angles of every corner of the toilets. I was so shocked that I decided to never play that stupid ghost photo game again. But as I was about to put the photos scattered all over my desk back in the envelope, I realised something. It was something so small. The negatives had two or three more pictures than were actually developed. I held them up to the window to look at them, but I couldn't make much out. They were just of that toilet stall. I asked my mother about the missing photos, and she unhappily said that she threw them away. I remember feeling so upset at that one sentence. They were my photos, and she threw them away without my permission. I didn't understand my mother's intentions so I angrily went through the garbage, tossing it here and there, looking for the photos. And for some reason, that particular moment is still stuck in my mind, even now. I think it was only two or three pictures, but I found them mixed in with the rubbish. Upset with what my mother had done, I angrily opened up the crumpled photos. And there, in the photo, I could see a woman with long hair, her neck twisted, looking down at me from the vent in the ceiling. I later heard from my mother that long ago, there was a student at our school who lost her legs in an accident, but right before she started junior high, she took her own life. Nobody knew why, but she loved PE class, and apparently when she got home from school, she always used to ride around her neighbourhood on her green unicycle. When I heard that, I was filled with a complicated mix of horror 
and sadness at the thought of this girl still trying to ride a unicycle with no legs. That's the end of what happened while I was at elementary school, but the story doesn't end there. Around June, when I was in the sixth grade, a classmate was watering the rice he was growing in a bucket after school, when he said he heard a strange voice and then saw a woman crawling down the hall. When the girls heard that, they screamed, and the boys all made fun of him. But by the time we graduated, everyone was calling that ghost Tsumbai-san. Yotsunbai means to crawl, so everyone shortened it to that. But I knew the truth. I knew that that woman didn't have legs anymore. And according to the student who saw her when he was watering his rice, that woman was crawling not on all fours, but just with her hands. This next creature is so mysterious and powerful that you must not say nor even write its name. Find out why in Marumaru-sama. Long ago, my grandfather worked for himself in the mountains. My grandmother, mother and I would then go up there to collect bracken while he worked. It was especially delicious when roasted, boiled or eaten with mayonnaise. One day, I was picking bracken with my grandmother, but I went a little too far into the mountain. I was in the upper grades of elementary school, so I knew what was dangerous and what wasn't. I kept going and eventually found a beautiful river. There was a rather large flat rock nearby, and lots of bracken on it. Did somebody pick that, I thought, but there wasn't anyone else nearby. Then, a large creature like a monkey appeared. Its body was spotted with moss, and it strangely looked rather majestic. It was also looking right at me. Is it on guard? I thought. But somehow, I felt like it was inviting me to come closer. Like it was saying, here, I'll give you some. But anyway, I was scared, so I ran. When I got back home, I told my grandmother about what I'd seen. Marumaru-sama noticed you, huh? She said. She actually said Maru Maru Sama. That wasn't the creature's actual name, but she said that we shouldn't ever say its real name. Names have power, so simply saying it takes power from that person, she said. Then she wrote a name on the ground. Even just writing it was rather dangerous, but she said, You must not ever tell this to another soul. The name was kind of strange, and not something I could pronounce. It didn't seem to be Japanese, and I had no idea how to actually say it either. That mountain wasn't a sacred mountain either, just a normal one. It can appear on any mountain, my grandmother said. It can even look different. It will give you what you want. It's large, and it's covered in moss. Apparently, my grandmother's grandfather also ran into it long ago. Then, my grandmother smiled and said, Thank goodness you didn't take anything. There's nothing scarier than getting something for free. I thought that was the scariest thing of all. Some kids experienced something baffling while on a trip to a snow lodge. Was it a ghost? A yokai? A dream? Find out in Hudebako-san. I stayed overnight at some lodgings on a snowy mountain as part of a kindergarten event. We were split into two groups, one who would stay in a small hotel and another who would stay in a lodge and I was in the lodge group. Oh, it's so cold, 
we all said as we looked at the snow while eating in the cafeteria. It was loud and noisy, almost like a university cafeteria. When my friend and I were done, we returned to the lodge, feeling full. But then my friend asked me a question with a strange look on her face. Hey, Chan, why did you ignore that girl while we were eating? Girl? There was a girl next to you asking you something. According to my friend, there was a girl in a dress trying to talk to me, but I didn't look at her at all and just kept eating. But this girl wasn't wearing our uniform, and she was wearing dirty shoes in the cafeteria, where shoes were forbidden. So my friend convinced herself that the girl must have been strange, and quickly moved on. The cafeteria was pretty loud though, and maybe she was from another school, I thought, as I reflected on my poor eating habits. So, what did that girl say? I asked. She kept asking you something, like, Are you Fudebako-san? Are you Fudebako-san? What on earth is that? I don't know. I was a little scared being away from my mother, so it kind of creeped me out, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. But that's kindergartners for you. That night, the teacher read us some books and we made frozen mandarins, so I quickly forgot all about it. The next day, there was a big fuss in the cafeteria. A kid from the hotel group was complaining to the teachers about something. I listened in. One of the boys snores really loudly, so us girls couldn't sleep. The rooms were split into boys and girls. We were annoyed and curious, so we went outside to see who it was. And at the end of the hall, I saw a long and silver case on the ground. We went to check it out, but then legs grew from the case, and it walked away. The teachers laughed and didn't take the girl seriously. That's because you didn't sleep. What a funny story. So you don't have any ghost stories? But the girl seemed to be quite serious. A long silver case. That's got to be a pencil case, I thought. A pencil case. Fudebako. Fudebako meant pencil case. I don't remember the locations of the lodge and hotel anymore, but I thought it must have something to do with the Fudebako-san that girl asked me about numerous times during lunch. I never told any of the kids at the lodge about that girl, so it couldn't be something they were making up after hearing that. That being said, what connection was there between the long case that grew legs and ran away and the girl in the cafeteria? Looking back on it now, it's still vague and doesn't make much sense. Was the girl a ghost? Was she looking for her lost pencil case? But then, why was she asking me, clearly a person, if I was Fudebako-san? The fact I didn't recognise that girl both made me happy and gave me chills. What if I answered yes? What if I answered no? When I was little, the only image I had in my head of ghosts was a woman dressed in a white kimono. So running into something as weird as that left me trembling and wanting to go home. Seeing me like that, the teacher put some delicious seasoning on my rice for me. I wasn't able to sleep that night, but I did safely make it home after. These days, I wonder if I ran into a yokai at that lodge. I've never heard of anyone else having a similar experience though, so I don't know. The creature in this next story has been terrorising a village for generations, and it seems there's no way to escape it. But what can you do once it sets its sights on you? Find out in Oppeke Sama.
I heard this story from a friend's grandfather when I went to stay at their family home one time. I'll call that friend A. His family home was in a village deep in the mountains, and when he was a child, I often went to stay with him during the summer. We loved playing in the mountains and by the river. One year, we were on our way home after catching sculpin fish in the river, like we always did. Suddenly, my friend's younger brother, who was in elementary school, I'll call him B, screamed. The moment I turned around, the area around his left eye seemed to deform and change. Huh? I thought, and then it disappeared, just like that. But B also passed out. Panicking, A and I took turns carrying him as we rushed back to the house. When we told his grandfather what happened, his face darkened. It was Opeke-sama, he muttered. You boys wait here. He then put B in the car and then drove to a nearby temple. A and I stayed behind at the house, no idea what was going on and waited for his grandfather to return. About two hours later he came back, but B wasn't with him. He'll be staying at the temple for a while, his grandfather said. And then he told us about Oppeke-sama. Oppeke-sama was a local yokai-type creature that had been around for a long, long time. Nobody was quite sure what it actually was. And apparently, one person from each generation in the village would be possessed by it. It looked somewhat like a human, and somewhat like a frog. A's grandfather liked anime, and he said it kind of looked like the foreman from Spirited Away. Apparently, when his grandfather was young, he once saw it in the mountains, and the moment he did, he got both chills and broke out in a sweat. He realised immediately that it was something dangerous. He was able to flee before the creature realised he was there, so he was safe. But apparently, if you look it in the eye, then it will possess you. When you are possessed, your face will change to resemble Oppeke-sama. And after you lose your mind, you'll go missing in the mountains. The day after that, your family will find a white plate on their doorstep, and they must use that plate for the rest of their lives. As long as you continue using the plate, your family will be safe and protected from disaster. So apparently in the past, people used to offer their children to Oppeke-sama, so they would be safe too. Of course, sacrifices were no longer offered in this day and age, but Oppeke-sama Peke-sama was still out there, and each generation, it possessed someone. It was for that reason that people from A's village always had more than two sons, just in case. After all, if a family only had one son, and he was possessed, then the family would be left without an heir. Come to think of it, A's father had three older sisters and was the youngest of five siblings too. During A's father's generation, apparently the person possessed by Oppeke-sama was a girl from a neighbouring family. Although, it was the countryside, so they still lived quite far away. At the time, they were able to stop her before she disappeared into the mountains, but her father, scared, then locked her up in the storehouse. The next day, they found the expected white plate on their doorstep, and in a fit of rage, the father smashed it. As a result, the father then passed out while he was working on the farm, and just like that, passed away. The mother then lost her mind and was hospitalised, and after that, the eldest son died in a motorbike accident. After hearing Oppeke Summer's story, a and I were too scared and worried about B to sleep. We spent the entire night crying. The next day, B didn't return from the temple, so A and I returned alone to A's parents' house. After returning, 
A became depressed and lost all colour in his face. And two months after that, he transferred to another school. B seemed to have returned to his parents' house from the temple, but I never saw him again after that. I felt uneasy, but I wasn't able to ask them if he had become like Opeke-sama. And after that, I grew distant from A, and then we lost contact. I don't know whether his family ever received a white plate, though, or whether they used it. It's not at all unusual for children to have imaginary friends, and they usually disappear as they get older. But what if those friends aren't exactly imaginary? And what if they're still there, even though we can't see them? Find out what happens in Akisama. My family ran an inn for generations. It was a large inn, so when I was young, my parents were always busy and I don't have many memories of actually talking to them. Someone from the inn would come and pick me up from school every day, meaning I couldn't play with my friends, and so the two of us would spend hours playing either in the main house or at the inn. The problem here being the two of us. I was an only child who wasn't allowed to go outside, so I didn't have any friends from the neighbourhood either. Yet, we played string games together, picked flowers together, and even played ball games together. Sometimes my grandmother would join us, and the three of us would play. But when I was tired and having a rest, my grandmother and my friend would talk and eat sweets together. I called this friend... Akisama. Years passed, and I had my own son who was in the first grade. He often plays catch by himself. When he gets home from school, he takes two gloves into the yard and screams, Akisama! before disappearing. I'm worried about him, but I also want to see Akisama again myself. Yet I've never seen her. Even if I follow my son, if I let my guard down for just a second, he disappears. But he always appears suddenly again at dinner time, saying happily that he was playing with Akisama. If you grow up, does that mean you can't see your friends like that anymore? Although, recently, I've started to wonder if I'll see her again once I become a grandmother. The creature in this next story sounds awfully similar to a popular urban legend, but this guy's about to learn a lesson all of his own. Find out why in Tsukima-san. When I was in elementary school, there was a rumour going around the town I lived in. People claimed that if you stood in front of a gap between two buildings at night on an empty road, then a long, slender arm would reach out and grab you, pulling you in. And nobody would ever see you again. This arm was so strong that even if you tried to shake it off, it was impossible. And the only people who were able to escape were those who had their clothes torn instead. People took to calling this creature... Tsukima-san, or Mr. Gap, and what made matters worse was that he didn't show up from one particular gap, but could show up anywhere in town. That's why us elementary school kids were terrified at the time. Even the junior high students were scared. Hell, even the delinquents disappeared from town at night. One summer night, when the rumours were in full swing, my cousin came over to our house with a strange look on his face. He was back for the Obon holidays, and I could tell at a glance that he didn't look well, like his face was pale. Somewhat afraid, I asked him what was wrong. No, it's just... 
when I passed this gap in the buildings just before. Well... Ah, I knew it, I thought. But something wasn't right. The rumours said that you couldn't escape him. My cousin continued, and it wasn't the story I was expecting to hear. A hand reached out from the gap and grabbed my wrist, trying to pull me in. And then... Apparently, my cousin threw him off, using so much force that it seemed he broke the other person's wrist. He wasn't pale because he had run into a monster. He was pale because he thought that maybe he had gone too far, even with a weirdo grabbing him in the dark. I was so impressed with his story that I told him about the rumours going around town. Ah, oh, seriously? Oh, thank goodness. So it wasn't a person then. My cousin was a fourth dan in Aikido, so he was actually relieved. I wonder if everyone who practices a martial art acts like that too. A decade or so later, I grew up and moved out of town. Just recently, I was talking to my younger brother on the phone, who still lived there, and suddenly I remembered those rumours, so I asked him about it. To my surprise... Tsukima-san is apparently still there. But now, it's a little different. Over a decade ago, the stories claimed that he would try to drag you into the gap. People were terrified of him. But now, apparently a hand just reaches out and pats people. My brother said it happened to one of his friends too. It made me realise that even monsters can learn their lesson too, huh? The family in this next story are especially kind to spiders, to the point where they get a reputation around town. But it seems those creepy crawlies are about to return the favour. Find out why in Kumo Sama. We lived in an old house in the countryside of Japan's northeast. For generations, our family had a custom of taking very good care of spiders, and as such, our house was full of them and often covered in webs. The idea of killing a spider was simply absurd, and during spring cleaning, we were told not to remove more webs than was absolutely necessary. When there were spiders who were nearly killed during cleaning time at school, both my older brother and I would put them in a cage to take them home to look after them. Thanks to that, our house was called the Spider Mansion. But we didn't have any flies during summer, nor cockroaches, so they were treated like members of the family. There might have been huntsman spiders too. I never saw any though. So, one of my classmates in high school often fell asleep during class. When I asked him about it, he said that he had nightmares every single night. He didn't really remember what happened in them, but it was the same thing every day, and they were terrifying. He hated them, and in the end he was unable to fall asleep at night, so he passed out during the day instead. During the summer of our final year at high school, he realised this wasn't a good habit to have, and asked us, his friends, for help. I talked to my brother about it, and he suggested something he brought back as a souvenir from his time studying abroad. It was a dream catcher, a Native American decoration that was said to protect you from bad dreams. This netting like a spider web will catch the bad dreams for you, he said. If a spider's web can catch bad dreams, then wouldn't a real spider be better? I said. And, like, we did live in a spider mansion. As such, the next day I took the dream catcher and a spider from our house in a bug cage to my friend's house. The day after the spider, Kumo-sama, moved in, my friend missed school. No way. 
This isn't Kumo-sama's fault, is it? I was worried, so I went over to his house after school with my older brother. I thought maybe something bad happened to him, but when we got there, it turned out he missed school because he had been sleeping all day. His parents knew that he struggled to sleep, so they felt bad for him and didn't want to wake him up. I don't really understand why, but I didn't have any nightmares. Kumo-san's amazing, he said. See? And they made fun of our house for keeping spiders. Those idiots. Kumo-san is the best. Super cool. My brother and I were more worked up than usual. I went to open the cage so we could gaze upon the countenance of the wonderful Kumo-sama. But then my hand stopped. Huh? Wait. The spider we gave you wasn't this big, was it? The spider I gave my friend was only about the size of a fingernail. But the one in the cage was clearly much bigger. It wasn't quite as big as a Jodo spider, but it was easily twice as big as the one we gave him. Maybe it ate the bad dreams, my friend said quietly. And until that spider died, he took incredible care of it. In the end, that insect cage had to be upgraded to a large tropical fish tank, and Kumo-sama looked most pleased in its new heated and air-conditioned room, with all the food it could want. That spider has since died, but even now, my friend still calls me once in a while, asking if we can give him another spider. Finally, a local kamisama offers protection in return for regular offerings, but when a young boy stays up to see what he really looks like, it could spell disaster for the entire town. Find out why in Shinjira-sama. During the summer holidays, I went to my grandmother's house. This happened while I was playing with my cousin and his friends. In the mountains near my grandmother's house, there was apparently a kamisama by the name of Shinjira-sama, and once a month, they left offerings for him. First, they wrote the name of the owner on a piece of paper in front of the house, and then they put some food on top of that paper. At night, Shinjira-sama would then come down from the mountain to receive the offerings. Then, the next day, the food would be gone, and instead, they would find one of Shinjira-sama's teeth. That tooth could ward off evil and protect those in the house. The day of my visit happened to coincide with the day they put out the offerings for Shinjira-sama, so everyone was excited. You should put out some food for him too, my grandmother said. So I put out some of the leftover sweets from the car ride there. That night, I stayed awake because I wanted to see Shinjira-sama. And then, around 3am, I finally saw a figure outside. It was around 2 metres tall, and it slowly approached the food before grabbing some and putting it in its mouth. I wanted to see it up close, so I quickly moved over to the window. And then, I saw Shinjira-sama properly. His body was covered in grass and flowers, but it was too dark to see his face. But then suddenly, he turned around and looked right at me. Our eyes met. And then, finally, I saw his face. His face was made of wood, and where his eyes and mouth should have been, there were just holes. As soon as I realised that was Shinjira-sama, he put down the food and muttered something before leaving. I was so scared that I ran back to bed and trembled until I fell asleep. Then, Shinjira-sama appeared in my dreams. He seemed to be incredibly angry and upset. When I woke up, it was morning, and everyone was being noisy about something in the living room. 
I asked what was wrong, and they said that Shinjira-sama didn't leave a tooth behind. Not just for us, but for the entire town. Did you see him? My grandmother asked me. I was scared she'd get angry, so I lied and said I didn't. Then she said she was going to ask around town and left the house. My cousin and I, left behind, went to play with his friend. Apparently their house didn't get a tooth either. We discussed what we should do and then decided to catch bugs in the mountains. In the end, I never found out whether offering Shinjira some of the leftover sweets was a bad idea or if I shouldn't have seen him. To this day, I still don't know. A massive thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier members, Just Sawn and Emerald. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Neikan, The Most Haunted Locations in Japan, Volume 3, out on Amazon right now. And check out our merchandise store at koabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Koabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Koabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.